the estimated value of these estates and the revenues derived therefrom valued in currency. Vienna rate represented a capital of 13 million three and four hundred thousand francs and a revenue of about 600,000 francs, French currency. This concession on the part of Austria was never made in earnest. The session to the son of the Queen of Echuria of the Duchy of Lucca, with the enjoyment of an annual income of 500,000 francs charged on these estates, the fee simple of which was not alienated, definitely assured to the Empress Marie Louise the integral life possession of the states of Parma. The pretensions raised by the court of Spain did not displease the allied sovereigns who were not reassured by the prospect of the establishment of the wife of Napoleon in Italy. They provided the text of new arguments which were employed with success to obtain from her that she should at least appear indifferent to the emperor's prospects. It was pointed out to her that any suspicion of complicity with him would deprive her forever of the advantages which the friendly feeling of Austria reserved for her, the loss of which would not only have been injurious to her, but also to the Austrian Empire. These considerations skillfully placed before her, the fear inspired into the Empress of injuring her father, her respect for whom increased in proportion to the affection, sterile as it was in appearance that he manifested towards her, the impossibility demonstrated to her of ever being reunited with the emperor, the Austrian public opinion, which influenced her, so to say, on every side, found her without defense. Later on, it was tried to push her docility to its extreme limits and to induce her to make a public manifestation against the emperor. But this she refused to do. This was a concession to old memories. Weak, it is true, but not yet effaced. At the same time, General Nyperg, whose functions as Chamberlain Grand Acre and Chargé d'Affaires attached him to the inner service of the Empress, was busying himself to assure her the free possession of the sovereignty which the treaties had granted to her. He made use of his influence with the Prime Minister, wrote Memoranda, and pleaded her cause with ardor. The Emperor arranged for interviews between his daughter and his all-powerful minister, so that she might speak to him of her affairs. Each day, there was a fresh story. Today, Parma was assured to her. On the morrow, it had been given to somebody else. These alternatives of fear and hope kept her anxiety alive and had the effect of disposing her for the sacrifices which were demanded of her and of increasing her desire to have her fate decided upon. They seemed calculated to aggravate the sad effects of the change which this dependent and undignified position had brought about in her ideas about France. General Nyperg came almost every day in the evening to dine and play music at Schoenbrunn. He afterwards returned to Vienna. His every nerve was strained towards one single object to succeed in the mission with which he had been charged to make the Empress forget France, and in consequence, the Emperor. The progress which he succeeded in making in the princess's confidence recommended him to the gratitude of the Austrian cabinet. As a natural consequence, the French, especially those whose attachment to the Emperor Napoleon was well known, were badly looked upon. The suspicion which they aroused had caused them to be excluded from any public post in Parma. If the Empress went there, no Frenchman was to follow her. She would only go under the guardianship of an Austrian minister with an Austrian governor who alone would be admitted to her confidence and to the directions of public business. The Bishop of Piacenza, Monsieur Fallot de Beaumont, made useless endeavors to preserve the Episcopal See to which he had been appointed by Napoleon. Count Saint-Vital, 
was introduced to Ray Louise as Grand Chamberlain of the Duchy of Parma in the course of November, and this revived her hopes. This seemed to her the effect of General Nyberg's energetic measures and a foretoken of her speedy occupation on the throne of Parma. By this general's advice, she addressed letters to the Emperor of Russia and the King of Prussia to commend her interests to their attention. These letters, which were approved of by her father, were carried by Nyperg. The general at the same time was commissioned to make a verbal communication on the subject to Lord Castlerow, who showed himself well disposed. Without admitting Count Nyperg to their presence, the two princes answered the letters of the Empress. Alexander's answer was in harmony with the character which he assumed in public. It contained promises expressed in kindly terms. The King of Prussia's letter contained nothing but vague and general assurances. Lord Castlerow, who had answered General Nyperg by word of mouth, did not think it necessary to write, but a week later presented himself at Schoenbrunn with his brother Lord Stuart in ordinary riding costume, top boots, and a whip in his hand. Not having been received, they asked to write down their names, and being told that that was not the custom, they would withdrew. The English minister made a large use of the protectorate in harmony with the way of thinking of the British cabinet and thought no doubt that an archduchess who had become the wife of the Emperor Napoleon had on that account lost her rights to any kind of respect. The assurance of the Agamemnon of the coalition and England's toleration gave the Empress some kind of security. Parma seemed likely to be assured to her in the future. There remained the question, a capital question in her eyes, to know whether she would be allowed to reside there. The Congress, which had progressed so slowly, was beginning to give signs of life, but nothing had been practically concluded except the surrender of Genoa to Sardinia, which made Countess de Brignol say that it was little to the honor of her country that all the sovereigns of Europe should have assembled in Vienna to decide about its fate, and that, that was the only reason for which they had come. Indeed, that was all that the Congress could boast about at that time besides the death of the poor Prince de Ligna, who had been finished off by the festivities. A much more grievous act, an act really iniquitous, was in preparation, namely the expulsion of the King of Saxony from his states. This good and unoffending prince, the most loyal and the most friendly of kings, in whom they were pitilessly persecuting the faithful and constant friend of Napoleon, protested against so revolting an abuse of force. The alleged decision of the Congress, which was notified to him, handed over the government of the Kingdom of Saxony to Prussian commissioners. The declaration made public by the king proclaimed his opposition. At the same time, he made it public that he would never consent to surrender the states which he had inherited from his ancestors, nor would he accept any compensation or equivalent which might be offered to him. Generosity was this time in harmony with the politics of the French cabinet. The French plenipotentiaries pleaded the king of Saxony's cause with force. The protection of France, to which that of Austria was added, a noble and generous protest from the princes of Ducal Saxony, who declared that they would not accept any portion of territory taken away from the King of Saxony. A declaration made by the small German states against any kind of parceling out of the German states recalled the great powers to moderation. They contented themselves with depriving the King of Saxony of half his kingdom the whole of which was swallowed up by Prussia, England who laid claim to the role of being alone the savior of Europe, prided herself on asking nothing for herself. The war in the Treaty of Paris had realized her ambitious views. She had acquired Malta and the Ionian Islands in Europe and had laid hands on almost all all the French colonies. She had seized upon offensive and defensive points in all the seas which favored her commerce and gave her the means of injuring the trade of other nations. She wished to establish her supremacy and render her role as a continental power more important by peremptorily declaring that she raised her electorate in Hanover to a kingdom and that she increased this territory 
by such of the neighboring lordships as might best suit her. Venice had asked for her independence. Austria answered this demand by imposing her rule on this republic. On December 12th, the anniversary of the Empress's birthday, the foreign princes sent her their compliments according to the German custom. She had gone away to spend this day in Baden so as to escape the bother of visits and compliments. Two days previously, the Emperor of Austria had gone to Schoenbrunn, accompanied by the Archdukes and Archduchesses, Marie Louise's brothers and sisters, to celebrate the occasion on Famia. The Emperor of Francis, who had announced his intention of being present, had been detained in Vienna by unforeseen business and had been unable to come. About this time, Fouché wrote letters from Paris to Prince Metternich. Napoleon's former minister, bored at having nothing to do, wished to take part in all and to set his mark on everything. He wrote to the Austrian minister that there could never be a more favorable opportunity for establishing the Empress Regent in France, that the new government had so offended public opinion that if the Emperor's son, riding on a donkey and led by a peasant, were to make his appearance in Strasbourg, the first regiment to which he would pr be presented would lead him to Paris without any obstacles being put in his way. I heard of these letters from Count Aldini, to whom they had been shown by Prince Metternich. Count Aldini had been Minister Secretary of State to the King of Italy in Paris. The Austrian cabinet, who had feared his influence, had summoned him to Vienna under the pretext of consulting him about Italian affairs. He had frequent opportunity of seeing the Prime Minister, but rather to show himself than to work with him. Since the letter which the Empress had written from X to the Emperor and which Monsieur de Basset had sent from Parma in the preceding month of August, all communications between her and the island of Elba appeared to have been forbidden. I wish to know what reasons she had for not writing shortly after her return to Schoenbrunn, whence I used to send news of the Empress and her son to the Emperor. I asked Marie Louise for a letter to enclose in mine. I then heard to my sorrow that Prince Metternich, in the course of a long interview, which she had had with this minister, had made her promise not to carry on any correspondence with the Emperor without her father's consent, and to hand him the letters which she might receive. The Empress added that she had consented very much against her will to this cruel necessity, despairing of being able to do otherwise. One day on her return from one of the daily visits which she paid to the Imperial Palace in Vienna, she brought back a letter from the Emperor Napoleon dated November 30th, which her father handed her. The Emperor complained of the Empress's silence and begged her to write him and give him news of herself and of his son. This letter had been four days in the hands of the Emperor of Austria. One of the Grand Duke of Tuscany's couriers had brought it. It had no doubt been shown to the sovereigns, for it was for this purpose, and in order to prove his good faith to his allies, that the Emperor Francis had exacted from his daughter all that letters which her husband should write to her should be handed to him. The Empress did not answer because the permission to do so had not been granted to her. I made up for her silence by writing myself. The Emperor, as soon as he had been informed that the privacy of his letters was no longer respected and that the Empress had been forbidden to write to him, ceased writing. In spite of the minute supervision to which I was subjected, Napoleon had not remained without news of his wife and son. I used to write to him by every possible means. I found facilities amongst the Viennese merchants, which I took advantage of to fulfill my duty. Some worthy merchants whose heart had not been hardened by politics and who had not lost nothing in business during the stay of the French at the time of the occupation in 1805 and 1809. I can say this without in any way diminishing the merit of their kind behavior, lent themselves in a very friendly manner to forwarding the letters which I addressed to General Bertrand by way of Leghorn or Florence. The Empress, who since her departure from France had neglected her drawing, took advantage of the presence of Isabelle of Vienna to recommence her les lessons. 
I have said that this clever artist had come to paint the portraits of the sovereigns, and he was, as a matter of fact, working at his picture of the assembly of the Congress. This picture is as remarkable from the good likenesses of the people as from the clever way in which Isabe grouped them. His brush must often have fallen from his hand, for he was engaged on a piece of work which must have been painful to a Frenchman. He used to sacrifice some hours of each week to go to the Empress and repeat the lessons by which she had so much profited. The want of occupation, the influence of her recollections, favored by the atmosphere in which she was living, prompted her also to seek relaxation in the childish amusements which had been familiar to her youth. She gave herself up to these frivolous and innocent pleasures when the bad weather interrupted her usual walks or her daily visits to the imperial palace. Sometimes she would master her dislike for business and attend to the reports which were sent or read to her by General Nyperk or by the minister who was governing the Duchy of Parma and who had come to Vienna for this purpose. The former read her one day a very serious memorandum, which she appeared to listen to with interest. It was a series of political and military considerations about Italy, in which the author had inspired himself rather with the political maxims of Themistocles than with Aristides, principles of virtue. This project of one of the men who used to accuse Napoleon the loudest of iniquitous ambition was very useful to Austria, but at the same time very unjust. Count Nyperg's memorandum recommended the adoption in Italy of a confederative system which in course of time would deliver up the whole peninsula to Austrian rule and cause all the little sovereignties which were not held by princes of the House of Austria to disappear imperceptibly. This memorandum might perhaps be found even now in the deed boxes of the Vienna Chancery. The annexation of the state of Genoa to the kingdom of Sardinia was the first step in the direction of the establishment of a confederation intended to unite the small Italian states against France to the advantage of Austria. This enlargement of the territory of a prince who had always been our adversary and the ally of our enemies was destined in the opinion of the great powers to increase his means of action and to render him master of France's outlets in Italy. The purpose of the allies was in one word to turn against us the immense fortifications of Alessandria and to protect lower Italy from a French invasion by the sea. My greatest pleasure was to pass a few hours in the young prince's apartment, his prettiness, his gentleness, his vivacity of his repartee, were full of charm. He was about four years old at the time, strong, well-built, and in excellent health. Fair, abundant, curly hair framed his face, the regular features of which were animated by fine blue eyes. His intelligence was precocious, and he was better educated than many children older than he was. Madame de Montesquieu, who never left him and who cared for him with a mother's solicitude, used to rise every morning at seven o'clock and begin his daily lessons immediately after prayers. Not only did the young prince read quite fluently, but he also knew a little history and geography and was acquainted with the first elements of knowledge. A certain Abbe Lanti, almoner to the French legation, used to come and talk Italian with him. A valet used to speak to him in German only. The child could already make himself understood in these two languages, but he greatly disliked speaking German, which he found hard and unpleasant to pronounce.